This is my honest review of the FlashForge Adventurer 3 3D printer and we're starting right now. Hello, my name is Daniel. Welcome to the Crossing channel. Our mission is to help 1 million people getting more successful with 3D printing. And if you're here for the first time, subscribe and hit the bell notification so you don't miss anything. So this printer arrived lately at my door, the FlashForge Adventurer 3. It was sent to me by FlashForge for free. So full disclosure here. Thanks for letting me test this FlashForge. But this review is my own opinions. I'm not biased in any way. As usual, everything mentioned in this video, like printing profiles, shopping links for the printer, etc., are in the description of this video. Let's run through the most important tech specs of this printer now. It's got a 150 by 150 by 150 millimeter print volume, which makes it perfect for most prints that most users will do. Although it's of course limiting you from printing bigger things like huge waste prints, but from my personal experience, the things that I print for most part are smaller than this. And you also have to consider that printing bigger also means consuming a lot more material. This printer is not moving the bed up and down, but it's rather the classical wrap wrap style of printing, like for example the Ender 3 or the Ana Day 8 does it, where the print bed moves in the y direction and the print head moves up and down and in the x direction. The build platform is heatable up to 100 degrees Celsius, so printing ABS should not be an issue, but more on that later. The extruder can heat up to 240 degrees Celsius maximum temperature, which is average, but also not overwhelmingly great. Printing anything that requires higher values like nylon seems out of reach for this printer. The extruder setup is a Bowden system where the filament is fed through a PDFE tube to the nozzle. The motor for feeding the filament is placed inside of the filament compartment, which is here at the side underneath this lid. Also located here is the filament sensor, which detects if filament is loaded in the printer and if your filament spool runs empty, like this one, it will pause printing until you load new filament. I will show this to you later in the video. Looking at the exterior, it has a closed print chamber, which essentially has two functions. First, keeping the printing temperature at a stable level, which is required if you like to print ABS material. And second, it reduces the noise level of the printer. And is a little sugar coating, there is a camera inside of the compartment here on the right hand side, which you can use to monitor what's going on with your print. That's really nice. Here at the front, we have the touchscreen display, which is used to control everything regarding the printer functions like starting a print, calibration, setup, etc. Connectivity-wise, the printer has a USB port for loading print models from a USB stick into the printer's own memory, which is at the front. The internal memory is eight gigabytes large. From there, the models will be printed so you don't have to keep the USB stick in the printer while the files are being printed. The Adventure 3 supports connecting to your local Wi-Fi network for remote control or alternatively you can use the Ethernet port on the back side to connect the printer to your local network. So how do you start using this printer? First of course you need to remove all the stickers from the outside of the printer and also this cardboard protection that was inside of the housing. The quick setup manual that's coming with the printer is short, but it explains the first steps really well. If you like to read the full instructions, you will have to download them from the FlashForge homepage. To start printing for the first time, you just have to load the filament, which is done through the printer menu and super easy to do. You just push the filament into the extruder until it reaches this point where the extruder gears are. Then push the filament load button and wait for the magic to happen. And then it's feeding the new filament in. You have to wait until you see the new filament coming out of the nozzle. Then you just need to confirm that this is done and you're ready to go for the first print. The first 3D model that I've printed was already on the printer's internal memory. It's just a little test cube to see if the printer works as expected. Printing this for the first time was okay, but when I tried this a second time, the cube detached from the build plate during the print and produced some spaghetti. So I had to calibrate the nozzle distance to the build platform to be a little bit closer to the platform. 
This is also done through the printer menu and super easy. The only complaint I would have about this feature is that it should warm up the nozzle and print bed before coming down with the nozzle, because first materials tend to warp and extend when they get hot, so the distances could be different compared to doing this at room temperature. And secondly, any material that might be oozing out of the nozzle tip will prevent you from doing a proper calibration unless you can wipe it off the nozzle because it's hot enough. So it makes sense to select the preheat option first, then wait until the temperatures have been reached and then do the distance calibration. However, I would recommend to repeat the distance calibration before starting to print anything that takes longer or is huge. And there is no corner bed leveling that you need to do. You only do this in the middle of the print bed. This is on the one hand making calibration easier, but also harder in some cases as we will see later. Now let's talk about the build quality. I was actually surprised how nice this printer looks from the outside. It's got a really good build quality. Everything looks clean and the clearances between the different materials are really perfectly flush. The construction looks also robust and durable. The door mechanism has a magnet that holds it closed, though it's easy enough to open it. Looking at the inside, the build plate is not magnetic, but it's mounted using two slots in the base platform where it slides in and then it locks into place. I think this is good and sturdy, but a magnetic build plate would have actually been easier to implement and still being reliable enough, from my opinion. By the way, I have done several, several prints and I can say that the first layer sticks really well on the surface for any kind of material that I tried. The build plate is moved along the axis running on one rod that sits inside the slot. On the right hand side it's running on a little wheel on the bottom of the housing. This is quite unique but in some prints I encountered issues with a lot of stringing and some parts fell down into the compartment. So you can imagine I'm a little worried that these might get underneath this little wheel pushing it up or making it stuck and causing even more issues. The slot on the other hand is also something that you need to keep clean because I don't think it's any good if rest of filament fall into it and get stuck there. The nozzle and heat block are looking really clean. Everything is closed and it seems this can be cleaned easily if ever filament gets stuck on the outside. Taking off the nozzle is also quite convenient if you ever run into issues with a clock nozzle so you can clean it or replace it easily. Also the nozzle and heat bed are warming up really quick so you don't have to wait very long until your prints will start. From initiating a print or starting a print it's usually less than 5 minutes. Let's look at the x-axis construction. This looks pretty normal. It's using a very similar drive than for example printers like the ANIT A8 which also have a horizontal rod and the carriage is moving along using linear bearings. I can also see there is a belt tensioner here for the x-axis which is really nice. However, I cannot see how to tension the belt for the y-axis. This might be a little bit more difficult. Also on the inside already I mentioned there is a built-in camera that you can use to watch your print from your computer. The resolution seems to be 640 by 480 pixels so it's VGA quality. This should be enough for most cases but it's also not overwhelmingly great. Then let's move to the front. Here we have the touchscreen display. It's bright and colorful. Also the touch responsiveness is really good. It's decently sized so you can read the menu easily and use it even with large fingers. Here on the right hand side we have the filament compartment underneath this lid. Now if you only look at the filament spool that was provided with the printer, this fits perfectly. However, I have so many other filament spools including the master spool system and none of them fits into this chamber. Either because those spools are too large in diameter or just too wide. So I guess unless you want to use small spools only that fit in here, you're probably most going to be placing your spools outside of the printer like I've done it here and I put it on a separate spool holder. This also means you will have to leave the lid open, which destroys a little bit the nice aesthetics of this printer's look. Now let's talk about how you can communicate with the Adventurer 3 and start prints at home and from the local network. First you can always bring a USB stick with a G-code file and use that locally at the printer. I did this for most part and you get to know the reason in a moment. 
Secondly, you can very easily connect this printer to a Wi-Fi network. Just select the Wi-Fi from the list of networks and then enter your Wi-Fi password and you're online. This also enables the printer to download firmware updates, which there is no other way to do this as this printer has no USB connector for uploading firmware or sending G-code commands over a USB cable like other printers like the Ender 3 and A9AA support it. When using any kind of network connection, you can send your prints to the Adventure 3 using the FlashPrint slicer software. Printing over the network worked without any issues for most part, but I'll talk more about the FlashPrint software in a minute, bear with me. Next, I tested the cloud connectivity of this printer. FlashForge offers different cloud connections. The first one which is mentioned in the manual is FlashForge's own cloud service that is called FlashCloud. However, I reached out to FlashForge support this week because I had severe issues with using FlashCloud because it was just super slow and unreliable to me. They directly told me to use PolarCloud if I'm outside of China and that they are trying to improve it soon for users outside of China, but it's going to take some time. So I would say don't waste your time now trying to get FlashCloud working for you. It really doesn't make sense and FlashForge is currently advertising PolarCloud as the perfect solution on their website. So I registered for a free account at polar3d.com and started to add the Adventure 3 to my profile. Here, uploading and printing a G-code file worked without any issues and even watching the webcam video live is possible. Now let's talk about the software that is to be used with the Adventure 3. FlashPrint is a slicer software that will take an STL file, for example, and convert it to the G-code commands that the printer understands. Basically, it works like Cura or similar programs and offers similar features. The installation is super easy and for most part, it's really easy to use as well. However, it still felt a bit limited in functionality if you look closer. I won't go into every single detail, but just picking one example, it does not support a feature like Z-Hop, which means when the print nozzle has to move between different parts of unrelated areas of the print, it won't be able to raise the nozzle, not to run accidentally into the borders of those parts, it's just not there. So if you're coming from Cura or Prusa Slicer, you will probably miss some of those advanced features. However, for most part, this software is probably absolutely enough for 90% of your use cases and works fine. But there is still a few things I don't like. One thing is that although the software easily finds the Adventure 3 in a local network and is able to send print files to it, it's not showing the remaining print time, just a percentage during printing, and it's also not able to show the camera image from inside of the printer. You have to enter the webcam address manually in the browser to see it, which works fine, but it's just lazy not to include this in the software. The other more annoying part about the software is that once you start printing 3D models which contain a lot of details, like this Baby Yoda figure for example, it gets super slow and it's not even possible anymore to send the print data over to the printer via the network once it's done slicing. The FlashPrint software is just giving up at this point, so you have to take the print file to your USB stick and start to print manually at the printer. Cura, for example, had no issue rendering this model and never crashed. It gets slower, but it's not crashing. Which brings me to mention my Cura profiles and settings that I've created for the Adventure 3. They are available on my website. I've put the link in the description of this video. Next up, the firmware of the Adventure 3. This is truly the first closed source 3D printer I've ever tested. Closed source means it's not based on an open source firmware like Marlin or anything that you could just download and customize for your own needs or improve in any way. So you are basically using what is provided by FlashForge. For most of us, this is totally fine and I don't see a reason that would urgently require to change the firmware. The user interface provided by the firmware is very easy to understand. It uses large symbols, which are mostly self-explanatory, and it reacts quick to the touchscreen and it reports back what's going on. I like to mention two things in particular, which are handled by the firmware really well from a user perspective. First, the filament change process is very easy. You basically press the filament change button, then the filament gets unloaded, you stick in the new filament, and press one button and wait until the new filament comes out of the nozzle. And then you press OK and you're done. Second, if the filament runout sensor is triggered because the spool runs empty during a print, 
This is reported on the display and you also just run through the filament change process, then the print continues at the point where it stopped and you're fine. I also checked if the printer supports to resume printing after a power loss, but that's unfortunately not supported. There's actually not much to complain about regarding the firmware, this is really nice. So let's talk about the print quality and some of the failures I had. As I mentioned in the beginning, I started to test some Q prints and first had to fix the nozzle distance. You could also call this bad leveling, but it's actually not because you cannot level the bat, but you can only set the distance of the nozzle in the middle of the print bed using the printer menu. What happened to me during some of my prints, I discovered the distance of the nozzle in the corners to be too far away from the print bed, although I had set a good distance in the middle. So I actually had to lower the nozzle even more to get this fixed for larger prints. This is the downside of only leveling for the middle. Now let's have a look at my print results here. I've started to print with PLA and this Banshee turned out to be really good. The quality of the surface is really beautiful. The only visible issue here is the stringing that is going on. I was actually trying really hard to get rid of the string, playing around with various settings, printing more and more stringing tests. I even repeated the string test with Cura to see if the way how the files are sliced makes any difference, but I never completely got rid of the stringing. However, this is really not a big issue because I got it reduced to a level where the stringing can be removed after the fact using a heat gun without any visible remainings. Then I was ready to move on to print something bigger and I decided that I wanted to test two things at a time printing something big that uses supports and testing the filament runout sensor. It turned out that the way how flash print creates support structures is only three supports and in combination with the missing Z-top feature mentioned earlier, it created issues by first cracking off some of the tree supports in some of the areas and then running into the printed part multiple times, creating some heavy layer shifting. The filament runout sensor however worked flawlessly and I tried it even multiple times and it resumed successfully every time. So the final result of this Yoda is questionable because of the layer shifts, but the actual outside quality for example in this rounded area here is actually really good. Next I started to print another big part, the singing dragon, which detached from the print surface in the last moment. So it only got printed by 95% and it's also showing some layer shifting, probably also because the nozzle was running into it at some point of the print. The last part is the Moe statue, which turned out really well, but it also requires no Z-hop and mostly no retracts. I suppose this is the reason why I also had no layer shifting. From the outside it looks almost perfect, although in the front the infill pattern is visible a little bit. At the back it's not visible at all, so I should probably increase the number of shell layers to get rid of this. Then I started to print ABS because this is why you would need a closed print chamber in the first place. Leaving the window open for this test was a must have because yes, ABS stinks quite a lot and the fumes are toxic. I used ABS Plus from Sundu just for your reference. Of course it takes much longer to warm up for printing ABS, mostly because the bed temperature is set to 100 degrees Celsius, but this is expected. The first ABS print is this Banshee, which turned out to be really good. Look at the surface finish, it's beautiful. Just a little bit of stringing going on here, but no bending up or warping. That's most probably because of the print chamber giving you a pretty constant and warm environment temperature. Next I printed this origami carabiner because I needed it for my bike to fix or follow me coupling when it's not attached to the kid's bike. This turned out really nice and rigid. So you see printing ABS on this printer gave me no issues, it just works. Overall I can say this printer was really fun testing, the results are really good and sometimes even better when using Cura. So check out my printing profiles and settings I've linked in the description of this video. Question of the day, is the Flashforge Adventure 3 worth the money? I would say yes, it's a really surprisingly good package for a beginner printer in the mid-range price segment. You can use it quite well with the provided software or Cura and use Polar Cloud for remote access. If you'd like to buy the Adventure 3, it's currently 50 US dollar off the original price using the link down in the description. Thanks again for Flashforge sending me the printer for testing.
So guys, let me know in a comment what you think about this printer and also check out the videos I've linked in these cards here and here. Thanks for watching. See you next time.